Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. On tonight's show, Adam Dools of Shore and Partners looks at the question, it's an important question too, is it time to buy tech? And if you want to go early, what does that mean? We look at companies like Zip and App and uh, Zero, and uh, also some of the American companies as well. So it's a very interesting topic and we're starting to see a lot of smarties thinking it's getting close to the time where you take a bit of a punt on tech stocks, but you're still going to have to wait for interest rates to either start increasing at a lower rate or even hitting a peak. But that's the question, when will that happen? Then we talk to Diana Messina from AMP, and she actually talks about the out outlook for interest rates, which kind of helps you work out whether you want to play tech now or wait a few more months before you get involved. And then Paul uh, Rickard of the Switzer Report looks at Westpac, which reported today, uh, is this a bank worth investing in? It's done pretty well of late, but is it still worth sticking with Westpac? And what's the dividend like? The dividend is actually quite attractive. That's the show. Let's now kick off with Adam Dawes of Shore Partners. Thanks for joining us, Adam. It's great to be here, Peter. Thanks so much. Look, I, I can't help but keep asking questions about tech because I, I, I hate to talk about a rotation once it's happened. I always like to alert people that you know, stock markets are always involved in rotations. And what we saw even in America last week, some really big name tech companies were actually sold off. I, I, think, I think Apple was down a real lot, maybe 9% mm. or something like that. But interestingly, I found on Friday, a lot of the tech companies actually had a much better day. Um, and it kind of coincided with the news that China uh, may will be lifting a lot of its restrictions. And I'm putting, I'm putting two and two together. I might be getting five and be happy to say, no, I don't agree. But if China gets back in the game more like normal, we kind of expect more growth for the world economy. And therefore, would that be good for growth stocks and ultimately tech stocks? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's more of a, a contrarian view that we're seeing at the moment where overall the market is very very skeptical on consumer discretionary stocks and tech stocks but if you take that a little bit further and if you you know you know that the market is a forward-looking machine whether that's six months or 12 months and if you take that contrarian view that potentially consumer discretionary and tech stocks will do a little bit better once we see the top of the hill top of the hill of interest rates that that basically means it is probably now a time to start looking at those tech plays, those consumer discretionary stocks for that level where interest rates start to, re not to reduce, mm. but to level out. And then from there, we can start to see the market moving forward. So, you know, a lot, the, the energy, or energy and coal have been the, the trade for this year. You know, that, mm. that, that's that defensive side of things and that's been long energy. But as interest rates start to potentially look at, the US might look at sort of pulling that back to 50 basis points or even 25 basis points in the new year. That is now the, the, the signal for those tech stocks to start to rally again. Mm. And um, it, it might be that you buy them today, but you close your eyes and put them in the bottom drawer for six to 12 months. But I think it's now is those winds of change are now starting to happen. And it potentially does look like that, that um, not the pivot, but it's definitely looking like it's, it's starting to get a little bit of traction going forward. Yeah, I know I've said to a lot of people when they've asked me, when is it the right time to buy a stock? And I say, well, if you're a bit of a thrill seeker, you do what you're saying. You, you kind of go in before the real reason yeah. for tech stock share prices to, to really take off. But if you're a more cautious investor, you, you wait, you see the market rise five or 7%, and you jump yep. on that on that uptrend. You might miss the first bit, but at least you're probably getting on a trend that could last two or three years or even more. I agree. The bottom bottom end of the Nasdaq this year to date was 35%. You know, Nasdaq mm. has rallied a good sort of five, even ten, even a little bit more so off that bottom. Mm. So it's already started to happen. But it's it's hard for investors to look at that when you're seeing Apple down so much, Netflix down so much. You're looking at all of these amazing tech businesses 
that should be making money and are still making money, but the overall market has really then pulled them back. It's hard for investors to then say, yep, this is the right time. Because I see that there's a huge disconnect between the what the investors are saying and what the economy is saying. And the economy is saying, look, it's not great for consumer discretion. It's not great for tech in the next six to 12 months. But these are the kind of things that you sort of noise that you need to be looking forward and looking through because that's how markets move. They are forward looking businesses yeah. and they look forward six to 12 months. And now's the time to be starting to look at those businesses because, you know, zero going from $150 down to $75 where it is today. There's a lot of value in some of these tech names at the moment. Yeah, I, I do remember a few years back where one of the uh, producers on my Sky News uh, program was a pretty heavy investor in Whitehaven. And he used to beg me, beg me to get the CEO of Whitehaven on the show on the supposition I could talk up the share price. I said, mate, I don't do that. I don't do that. But look, <laughs> he's pro provided he didn't get out, he's laughing all the way to the bank. 100%. And, you know, we've, we'll, Whitehaven's a, f a fantastic business, but we've, we've actually put a trading cell on Whitehaven at the moment. So I'm taking some profits here. I've also put a trading cell on PLS the lithium side of things. Yep, I think yep. that also has run its course. It's not a sell because it, the business is fine. They're still doing buybacks, cash is coming in, but I think a trading sell for those clients that have made a bit of money, double their money, take your original investment out. You know, you can find some other stuff to, to be investing in, but certainly those white havens have done fantastically. Coronado came out today saying that they weren't going to merge with Peabody. There was a bit of selling in the morning but that stock just rallied back quite quickly as well. So, you know, there's there's still a lot of, to go within that energy space and especially that coal space going into 2023. Okay, let's just talk about um, tech. And it's interesting, you know, that those Zeet stocks that I like, and they did very well when I, when I first liked them, they were beating even wax. Of course, they've been clobbered uh, in, uh, of late. Um, yeah. But we know ELO has a takeover offer. We know Tyro is being chased as well. Yeah. EML, if you can sort out this problem with the Bank of Ireland, it also has been a takeover target as well. And do you think a company like Zip will eventually be bought out by a bigger buy now, pay later business just purely for the, the, the customers it's got? Well, you know, with the amount of merchants that it has and the amount of customers that they have on their books, any bank would love to have that database. Mm. There is absolutely no doubt about it. That database is 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 absolute gold. At 66 cents, you're right. Uh, it, it looks like it's a bit of a steal here. Uh, and I think overall, Zip uh, is, is going to struggle. When interest rates start to fall and consumer discretion areas back on, yeah. then I, I really think Zip will do well. We did see that Larry Diamond's moving over to America um, we did see that Block came out with their quarterly the other day, and that actually wasn't a bad quarter yeah. for uh, for them as well. So, you know, potentially things are starting to turn around, but it does take time, and you just need to have faith in what's going on with these things. I think Zip overall uh, structurally is a, a, a very good business, but it's in the right wrong part of the cycle that we're in at the moment. So, yeah, as interest rates potentially fall. Most of those tech stocks are looking quite good as well. We've got some fantastic tech businesses here in Australia uh, that are making money, that are revenue positive, and you can see that with all of that sort of those uh, private equity guys and all those coming in, they can see the value in what we have right. here in Australia. Yeah. But it just hurts because those clients have been long suffering clients or shareholders, yeah. and it's tough to be holding some of these things that haven't done so well. So. Yeah. Yeah, faith, I think, is what yeah. we need to have yeah. in this business. You, you sound sometimes. like, you sound like, uh, what is it, um, Michaels, what's it, what his name? The singer? Uh, George Michaels. George Michaels, faith. You've got to have faith. faith. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> now, just before we, we wrap it up, Adam, uh, you, you, know, you touched on, on, on Zip. Uh, I was given a question only today about Appen. And I said, look, Appen has its problems. It was a very good company when the market when it was able to, I guess, get involved in people's privacies a lot better than you can nowadays. But I said, yeah. look, problem, and the, and the person in question, I think, I think the share price is now $2.40 and he bought it $2.75. I said, look, when tech bounces, 
Apple will go up. It just won't go anywhere near where it was when it was twenty or thirty dollars stock. Is that a fair yeah. call? Do you reckon that Apple will eventually have a bounce when all tech bounces? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or, or well, a, tide, a rising tide rises all boats. So yes, I use the exact it, same cliche, Adam. <laughs> there you go. We're, yeah. we're talking for the same script. Yeah. But look, look, yeah, certainly Apple. Uh, it won't go as high due to the fact that we've seen their major customers, which were the sort of the big five, have been Meta, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Microsoft, all of these businesses have now brought a lot of the uh, IP that Appen had and they've brought that in-house. And they're using that instead of uh, using a third party, which is Appen, where they used to be able to outsource that, they've brought that all that, that in-house. So Appen really has to look at how it's going to reinvigorate its business, re-energize the business. Yes, it will go up and yes, it will with the tech side, but it won't get back to those normal or those lofty heights because the market has moved on. The market has seen that they can do that kind of thing by themselves mm. uh, and, and they've employed people to do it. So uh, it, it does leave Appen uh, with a strategy that they need to turn this business around. They need to look at something uh, other than what they used to do and that still remains to be seen in the market. So it's a tough one. Yes, it will rise, but it will never get back to that sort of lofty heights that it previously saw a year, two years ago. No, totally agree. Mate, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Yep, that's Adam Dawes of Shaw & Partners. Now joined by Deanna Messina, who is the Senior Economist at AMP. And I want to catch up uh, and talk to her about the, the big economic uh, events that could have serious market implications. Great to see you, Diana. Thank you for having me on, Peter. All right, so let, let's talk about the two big events this week. One is the US midterms. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know on Sky News this morning, I was asked, how is the market going to react to a Donald Trump win or effectively a Republican win? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, because I think last time he won the election, they loved it, but mm. they got to know him. They, they could have a different view. Is there a, a market view of what the US midterms might mean to markets as well as ultimately the economy? Well, usually the historical pattern in midterms is that the, yeah. the, the party that has the majority at the time mm. usually loses its majority in either the House or the Senate. That mm. typically happens across all midterms because mm. voters get a bit frustrated with the governing party and release their frustrations at the midterms. And this year, I think it won't be any different. We will see the Democrats lose their majority in both the House and the Senate, or at mm. least that's how the polls are telling us it will go at the moment. The yeah. Senate is a bit contentious. You know, there's still a 50-50 chance mm. uh, that the Republicans won't gain control, but uh, the Democrats will lose at least one of those mm. um, houses. Now, the implication for markets actually from that loss of majority is not that negative. Usually after the US midterms, markets rally in the year after the midterms yeah. quite strongly. Third in, year of presidency is really good. Isn't yeah, it? it's the yeah. best year for markets across the four year presidency. And I think one of the reasons is because the midterms are seen as the source of risk. The yeah. risk is is gone once you uh, once you finish the process. Mm. And secondly, because gridlock, mm. where you have one party has control of one house, one party has control of another house, and, uh, and one party obviously has the presidency. So it's harder to pass policies. They have to be more bipartisan. Mm. They have to be more central. That's actually positive for markets because you don't see as many far right or far left policies. Yeah. Yeah, so it's less curveballs for a market. All right, so let's m move to the second event, um, and that is the inflation number mm -hmm. later this week. Uh, I've, I've, I've had the view that, you know, it, it's sort of kind of been persistently in the sevens. Uh, if it drops into the sixes and it's a decent drop, the market would really love it, wouldn't it? I think we're getting really close to an inflation <coughs> downside surprise because all of the forward-looking indicators for goods prices Which you plummeting. guys have been championing, if you're part <laughs> well, We have been, but we've kind of been a bit early on this, I think. Hmm. Um, and the reason that our inflation indicator probably hasn't predicted the fall in inflation as fast um, as usual is because services inflation is still so sticky hmm. and still probably rising yeah. because things like rents are still going up. And that forms a large chunk of the CPI, about 30%. And stinking airline services, they're, they're staying up big time, aren't they? And that's probably a post-COVID issue, mm. which will 
dissipate next year, but mm. for now, airline prices still extremely high. So goods inflation, I think, will, is going to fall very quickly, and that will form some downside inflation surprise. So I do think that we are due for a downside inflation surprise. Yeah. Let's, let's stick to the, the goods inflation side of it. Um, and the market really loved hearing that China might be easing a lot mm. of its restrictions. That should be good for reducing cost inflation over the next six to 12 months? To some extent, yes, because it Don't disappoint me, Diana, by being I have being to be a two-handed economist. Okay, right, yeah. So potentially, yes, because China will open up manufacturing <coughs> and production more. Mm. But on the other hand, a stronger Chinese economy with reopening means stronger demand for commodities, and that will put upwards pressure up with pressure on commodity prices, which are already elevated, yeah. especially on the oil price. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good for our, our overall market index if the, the miners are going higher. And generally, a positive view on China will be good for emerging markets because it will follow the lead from Chinese stocks. But mm. I mean, Chinese stocks have been having a really difficult time over the past few weeks after the National Party Congress. Mm. And it's difficult to see a continued rebound on a medium term basis in Chinese stocks. We've become quite negative on the Chinese economy. Yeah. It's interesting that um, as soon as the president has his um, term reaffirmed, some policies like zero COVID aren't as important as they were before the, um, the, the um, get together of all the, the Chinese voters. I still think that zero COVID might, uh, you know, it might be wound down somewhat. I think that's what we're starting to see from, you know, the whispers last mm. week or the rumours that the that China will get rid of zero COVID. I think that there is still some truth to it. They will water down their policies, but mm. it will take time, and it won't be just a completely a band aid approach of we're letting COVID rip. Okay, I um, predicted ages ago that I thought the markets rebound would be more likely in the December quarter. Mm -hmm. Gave myself three months. And it was a nice one on the Dow in October, a good start. Jerome Powell kind of took a bit of the wind out of my sails. Um, and I know some economists are saying, well, if we thought maybe uh, peak interest rates might have happened by the end of the year, they've now pushed it into, where do, you th where do you think, or when do you think the Yanks might stop raising interest rates? probably around the end of the first quarter next year for the US. Mm. I mean, for Australia, we actually don't see any more rate rises after December. Mm. So the peak will be much sooner. Ever? Then, ever? Uh, for this cycle. Okay. Um, never say never. <laughs> no, no by, 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 by this cycle, being that, we, that cash rate would be pretty well cl close to the peak. Yes. Okay, right. And clearly the money markets are still pricing in a 4% cash rate here in Australia. Um, so, you know, the risk is obviously that we're incorrect in that view and mm. that there'll be more rate rises next year. But for Australia, we see the peak at the end of this year. And for the US, I, th I think it will have to be somewhere at the end of the first quarter, maybe the beginning of the second quarter, because the, Fen the US Fed is already talking about when they get to that point where they will have to slow the pace of tightening. And they will slow the pace of tightening in, the, in December mm. when, they, when they have their next meeting, oh, we think. And because stock markets tend to jump ahead of reality, mm. do you think when there's a there's more at this case at this stage, it's you guys as a group economists guessing what Jerome Powell might do? And of mm. course, it's brilliant guessing. I'm not going to call it well. Let's just call it forecasting. Okay? Um, but once the market really believes that 0.75 percent rate rises in the U.S. are over, and the market could be on the 0.5 or 0.25 mm. down the track, do you think the market would say? it's time to start looking for a lot of the companies that we've been bashing up because of high, high and rising interest rates. You mean they'll be looking at them in a, in a Gr positive Growth stocks will become more popular. Put. Well, if we see the peak in bond yields, which mm. I think we probably will once, mm. we, once we start to see the central banks pausing on, its, on, their, on their rate hiking agendas. Yeah. Um, but will growth stocks recover back to where they were before the central bank started tightening? I'm not sure. They'll have, they, they probably will have some rebound because mm. we'll see you know, that the, the high in interest rates has been set, but I'm not sure that the longer term outlook for them is as positive as it was a year ago. I don't think it is, mm. given that the economy is different and mm. the, the actual base for interest rates is much higher. Okay. Put, putting together all the, the sort of um, challenges or headwinds the markets have had to deal with this year, which many of them are starting to dissipate, you know, rising mm -hmm. interest rates and all that sort of stuff. 
you kind of think we're close to a point where they'll start to dissipate. What's the AMP view on stocks for 2023? What kind of a rise are you guys guessing? Well, in the short term, we're still negative hmm. and we see potentially more downside, maybe another 5 or 10% in you know, the next, say, one to three months. Uh, the, the risk is still to the downside. Um, although you can have these bear market rallies like mm. we've seen throughout mm. this cycle. But on a 12 month view, we think that the major economies are going to avoid a recession besides Europe. So mm. we think Europe was likely to go into recession mm. end of this year, early next year. Um, the Q3 GDP numbers out of Europe were actually positive. So mm. that, that probably means that they weren't in a recession yet. Mm. Um, but we think it's coming because of high inflation ultimately. Yeah. Uh, we think the US will, av will, av will avoid a recession. So we're still optimistic on stock markets on a 12 month view. And we think returns can be somewhere around five to 7% or so. Gee, that's conservative. I would have loved you said 20% or something <laughs> like that. Okay, fair enough. So that's, so you, you, uh, what would change your view either to become more positive or to become more negative? More negative is probably a bit easier, so I'll start with that one, mm. um, the risk of recession. So I suppose once we see the dust settle with these rate rises, we've seen the peak in interest rates, how will the economy go mm. and respond to these high interest rates? Mm. And will some of those recession indicators that are currently flashing orange or red, will they actually go through and into the, into the growth indicators and mm. will we see a recession come through? If we do see a recession, then share markets have more downside. On the upside, if inflation comes down more quickly than what people expect and central banks have to actually pause quicker than what markets are pricing in and we start to see some pricing of rate cuts in the second mm. half of next year, which I think is a big possibility, then I think that the share market can probably rally. Okay. Let's finish up on something you already touched on. Um, do you, where do you see the cash rate peaking for Australia? 3.1%. Yeah. So that's another rate rise from here. Money market is over 4% still. Mm. Even if we're wrong in 3.1, I think it will be 3.35, maybe just over 3.5. Mm. I, I just don't see how it's possible for the cash rate to go to 4% in Australia without causing significant ec economic um, mm. pain. Mm. And I don't think it's necessary to get inflation down. We don't have a wage price spiral. Inflation expectations are not out of control and there's no signs that inflation psychology, which the RBA keeps talking about, has become unanchored. So I don't think the pace of rate hikes needs to be as strong in Australia as it is in the US. Okay, one, one related question. Um, and we saw today that auction clearance rates was surprisingly coming back, which kind of in the, implies that sellers are get, getting realistic and buyers must be showing up to buy. Mm -hmm. um, does this make you think that maybe house price falls across the country might not be as bad as 20%? I don't think so because the cumulative impacts of those rate hikes haven't fully come through yet. The majority of those fixed loans don't ex don't reset until next year, mainly the se from the second half of next year onwards. I think we haven't really felt the whole pain of how much the RBA has hiked so <coughs> far and they're probably going to do another one. So yeah. we will start to see that play through more next year and consumer spending, I think, will really start to slow down. We've got a very um, depressing growth profile for Australia next year, you know, growth of just over 1.5% mm. over the year to December. That's very low for Australia and rising unemployment rate. I think in that environment, house prices will, f will fall further. Mm. The, the only thing I will say is that those forecasts have been made by Treasury and the Reserve Bank. And they're not the greatest predictors of our economy. But you don't have to say that. You don't have to say that. I can say that. Deanna, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. That's Deanna Messina from AMP. Well, in the US, banks have been pretty popular lately and uh, locally Westpac reported today. Let's just see how it reported and uh, what the future is of banks generally. Paul? Yeah, I mean, Westpac did uh, okay, Peter. I mean, it came in with a, uh, a half-year profit of uh, $3.5 billion, and that was up from 3.1 in the first half. Yeah. That's probably the best number to look at. There are just so many numbers floating around, and whether you look at uh, you know abnormals and not abnormals and the rest of it, but that's sort of the underlying business. But that was really pretty much exactly as the market expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, I think, you know, 
it, it sort of highlighted a few challenges around the so-called exit NIM, which is the net interest margin when you finish. Yeah. Uh, plus, again, it was pretty much a workmanlike result. Everything was telegraphed. Everything was came out. You've got to remember, bear in mind that Westpac's been one of the best performing banks over the last week, month or so, up 17% since yeah. the start of October. Yet regarded one of the, the worst of the fall. Yeah, I mean, look, mean reversion, you know, like it, it's got too cheap and the market bought it up. And I think the market said, OK, well, it's got the result and that's why it's off 4% because it was not much more than what it was expected. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's not the bank that's going to take you forward. I think that's probably what the market is saying. Uh, um Recently, we've seen them interested in Tyro. Um, are, they, are they doing anything else out there that might impress No, the, the, the agenda is still very much uh, fix and simplify, mm. and uh, that really hasn't changed. Um, and they're, they're way well through the program, but mm. um, that's still in hand. What they did also say today is that they, uh, about 18 months ago, they announced a very ambitious target to get their cost base down to $8 billion. From it, then, it was about $10.5 billion. Mm. Uh, today they toned that target up a bit because they're not going to get to $8 billion. This is by the end of FY24 mm. uh, and they increased the target from 8 to $8.6 billion, blaming you know, higher inflation than when they made the, made the announcement and also just some ongoing compliance programs. I guess the market never really thought they were going get, to get that done in the first place. Mm. Um, but uh, this is probably a bit more reality. I think the thing with Westpac, Peters, it's just, it's, look, there's, there's some positive things, you know, they have fixed, they have simplified, but sort of what happens next? You know, it's sort of, you know, with the Commonwealth Bank, you've got relative security, you can see that they're consciously trying to grow their business. Uh, it's a really well run bank. So is the NAB, which is sort of the pretender, I guess. Um, so you've got relative safety in both those banks. Westpac is sort of, you know, Vying with ANZ for sort of fourth position, <laughs> uh, do, do, does okay, mm. uh, but the market's bought it up on doing okay, and uh, so where to next? And you don't really get a sense that if you sort of project a couple of years out, that it's really going to set the world on fire. Uh, have banks run their race poor, or do they have, you know, five or six percent gain ahead of them? Look, I think banks are still doing okay, and I I, I feel that there's still a bit left in them. I mean. Where the sort of market got ahead of itself is is that it was actually right in thinking that higher interest rates are good for banks, right? They're yeah. good in the short term because, uh, you know, banks are able to increase their net interest margin because there's a lot of money sitting in, in zero rate deposits or check accounts that doesn't, doesn't move. The rate never changes. And mm. so when you can actually lend at a lot higher rate to everybody and not have to pay the same to depositors, mm. your margin increases. But they sort of got, they, they, the market then got excited about the next point, which is in the long term, higher interest rates are bad for banks yeah. because ultimately borrowers get challenged by the cost of having to pay more on interest. Yeah. If the economy slows, which you is know, expected, which is expected uh, you know, people lose, you know, people default on mortgages and businesses go out of business. But that all takes a long time and the, and the market sort of got, you know, too far ahead of itself and said, this is going to happen tomorrow. Well, hey, presto, it's not going to happen for a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the market and the rally we've seen the last sort of, you know, since sort of June has been almost the, the market saying, yeah, we got that wrong. Banks are actually going to do really well. And they are doing well. Mm. Uh, and that's why Westpac's profit from, you know, 3.5 this half versus 3.1 the first half is a lot higher. That's, yes. that's, that's good progress. But they probably have a bit further to go. But in, if the higher interest rates go, Peter, and the more we, we, start, we start to think about a recession, the more challenged that they're going to become. And that's yeah. probably the point of caution. Yeah. And so I, I guess the, the bottom line is if these current forecasts of the Aussie economy slowing down to 1.5% next year ends up being too negative, which can often be the case, the banks could actually do a lot better than people are expecting. Yeah, and I think I think that's probably still on the cards because the, probably the market is still bearish on, on, on banks. I mean, just just to give you an, uh, an idea of where we're headed at the moment. I mean, in this current half, I mean, Westpac's um, bad debts, this is credit and payment expenses, were around about five basis points of loans, which is point mm. zero point Small. zero five percent. A typical level is twenty to twenty-five, right? Mm. So we've got a long way to go. <laughs> mm. Before 
you know, any of the pressure from higher interest rates starts to impact. And it really won't have much impact unless people start losing their job. And that's not happening yet. No, so not. this is a long way down the track. So, you know, in the short term, you're going to see a lot higher earnings from banks simply because of, of the impact of higher interest rates. And so that's positive. So, and you're going to get higher dividends because they've got too much capital. So, um, look, there's a lot of positives about being a bank shareholder. I just think that when people looking at the banks, they're saying, you know, there's a, there's a premium attached to sort of the security of CBA and NAB, uh, and Westpac and ANZ don't have that premium. And so they sort of get left behind. So we saw the rally coming into the result. Okay, that happened. They delivered as we expected. Okay, now we don't want to own them again. No? That's yeah, sort of okay. the way I'd read the way the markets and, look and, at it. And what are they paying as a dividend, Paul? Look, not too bad. It's 125 cents they're going to pay for the full year. That's on a share price of, uh, of, of $24. That's yeah. over 6%. You know, add franking, so mm. that takes it up to almost 8%. So dividends are attractive, um, mm. and I don't think there's any risk. You're going to get higher dividends. So, mm. you know, I think banks stay a little bit overweight, but I think you're probably going to get mark bouts of market nervousness, bouts when the market starts to worry about bad debts, when you might see slightly more attractive levels to get yeah. set at. And so in the eyes of, of, of uh, the market experts, banks are more value stocks than growth stocks. Yeah. yeah, and so eventually growth stocks will take over from value stocks, which are kind of dominating the market right now. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, um, you know, we, we're sort of value stocks and perhaps the more defensive end of the market's yeah. a bit more in vogue because, you know, you're not going to, it's just, and that's the way banks have been trading. They haven't gone down too much when the market's fallen off. Yeah. And they've come back pretty quickly. In fact, some of the banks, most of the banks are higher than they were at the start of the year. Yeah which tells you something when the market's down. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's about, it, I think it's got, it's got that sort of benefit. Now, at some stage when the market gets excited about growth again, you know, banks yeah. will get left behind. Yeah, because yeah, the smarties will sell off, take their profits in banks and plow them into the text. But I guess that's a story for another occasion. That's Paul Rickard from The Switch Report. If you want to know more about The Switch Report, go to switchreport.com.au. And that's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're back on Thursday, of course. And don't forget, if you want more insights, the kind of stuff that we don't always talk about on the show, go to switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining us. See you on Thursday.